When I was 12, my mom died, and everything changed. My stepbrother framed me for a crime, my family abandoned me, and now, 30 years later, they want forgiveness. My mom passed away when I was 12 from breast cancer. That's where it all kinda starts, I guess. Losing her was like a gut punch I wasn't ready for. She was the glue holding everything together, and when she was gone it was just me and my dad. It was rough, for sure, but we did okay for a while. He worked long hours and I just kind of kept to myself, trying to figure things out in a world that didn't make sense anymore. It's not like my dad was a bad guy. He was just, distracted, I guess. After mom passed, he threw himself into work, probably as a way to cope. He wasn't around much, but when he was, we got along fine. We had a decent routine going, but something was missing, you know? It felt like we were just two people living in the same house rather than family. I didn't really have friends I could lean on at the time, so I just did my own thing, trying to stay out of trouble and out of my dad's way. Things started to change when I was 14. That's when my dad met Ashley. She seemed nice enough at first. She worked at some office, and they hit it off pretty quickly. I remember the first time she came over for dinner. It was a little weird seeing my dad with someone else, but I figured if she made him happy then maybe it was a good thing. It wasn't long before she and my dad got married, and just like that, I had a new family. Well, sort of. Ashley had two kids from her previous marriage. Mark, who was my age, and Emily, who was a couple of years younger. I was willing to give it a shot, you know, try to be cool with it. I figured we'd all get along, and maybe things would even get better for me and my dad. I guess I was pretty naive about that. To be fair, Emily wasn't bad. She was quiet and kind of kept to herself, which was fine by me. We didn't have much in common, but we didn't clash either, so that was a win in my book. But Mark? Man, Mark was a whole different story. From day one it was clear that Mark didn't like me. I'm not sure why, but he seemed to have it out for me from the start. He had this attitude like he was better than me or something. My dad kept telling me to give him a break. That it was hard for him too, since he had been the man of the house before Ashley met my dad. Like, cool, I get it. But what about me? I lost my mom, and now I had to deal with this new family dynamic. It was tough for me too, but no one seemed to care about that. Mark and I fought constantly. Stupid stuff mostly. Who got the TV remote, who sat where at the dinner table, that kind of thing. I tried to keep my cool, but he knew exactly how to push my buttons. It didn't help that my dad always seemed to take Mark's side. I guess he felt guilty about the whole situation, but it felt like no matter what happened, I was always the one in trouble. One time we got into a huge argument because Mark stole one of my shirts and refused to give it back. When I confronted him, things got heated, and we ended up wrestling on the floor. Of course, Ashley walked in right as I was pinning him down, and she lost it. She screamed at me, saying I needed to learn how to control my temper, and that Mark was just trying to adjust to his new life. I was the one who got grounded for a week, even though it was Mark who started the whole thing. It wasn't just the fights that got to me, it was the way my dad seemed to be slipping further away. He and Ashley were always wrapped up in their own world, going out on dates or spending time with her side of the family. It felt like I was being slowly pushed out of my own home. I'd come home from school, and there would be this tension in the air, like everyone was walking on eggshells around me. It was exhausting, and it started to wear me down. When I turned 15, I finally had something that made me feel like my life wasn't completely falling apart. Her name was Lisa, a girl I met at school. We started hanging out, and soon enough, we were dating. Well, as much as you can date when you're 15, she was funny, smart, and most importantly, she made me feel like I wasn't completely invisible. Things were going pretty well between us, but of course, Mark had to mess that up too. Apparently, he had a crush on Lisa and wasn't too happy that I was dating her. I didn't even know about it until one day at school when he came up to me and started mouthing off about how I stole her from him. It was ridiculous, but he was dead serious. We ended up getting into another fight right there in front of everyone. The teachers broke it up before it got too far, but the damage was done. When I got home, my dad was waiting for me. He was furious. Mark had already spun the whole story making me out to be the instigator. Once again, I was the one in trouble. It didn't matter that Mark had started it, that he was the one who had the issue. In my dad's eyes, I was always the problem. I was grounded again, and this time, it felt like a final straw had been pulled. I was angry, frustrated, and just plain tired of trying to fit into a family that didn't seem to want me around. The more time passed, the more isolated I felt. My relationship with Lisa started to get strained too. She didn't understand why I was always in trouble at home, and I couldn't explain it in a way that made sense. I mean, how do you tell someone that your entire family seems to be against you, but it's not really your fault? We were still dating, but things weren't the same anymore. It was like I couldn't catch a break, no matter how hard I tried. Looking back, it's easy to see that the writing was on the wall. Everything was heading towards something bigger, but I didn't see it then. I was just a kid trying to survive each day, hoping that maybe tomorrow would be better. Alright, so here's where things really hit the fan. I had just turned 16, and life was already feeling pretty unbearable. The constant fights with Mark, being ignored by my dad, and the whole situation with Lisa starting to fall apart, it was a mess. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. It was like all the bad stuff I'd been dealing with got cranked up to 11. One day, I'm just hanging out in my room. Lisa was over, and we were watching some dumb TV show. It was nice to have her around, even if things between us weren't as easy as they used to be. We were trying to enjoy the evening, when suddenly, we hear this loud yelling from down the hall. It was Ashley. She was losing it, screaming my name at the top of her lungs. Lisa and I looked at each other, and I remember feeling this cold chill run down my spine. You know when you just know something's about to go really, really wrong. That was the vibe. We both rushed out of my room and followed the yelling, only to find Ashley standing in my bedroom doorway, holding up a bunch of clothes. I remember thinking, what the hell is this about? Then I saw what she was holding. It was a handful of Emily's underwear. I froze. I couldn't process it at first. Ashley was screaming, waving them around, accusing me of stealing them. She demanded to know why I had them in my drawer, what kind of sick person I was. My head was spinning. I'd never seen those before in my life. I had no idea how they ended up in my room. I tried to explain. 
I really did, but it was like talking to a brick wall. Ashley wasn't hearing it, and to make matters worse, Mark showed up. He's got the smug look on his face, and before I can even get a word out, he starts piling on. I always catch him staring at Emily, he says, all innocent-like. It's creepy. I've heard him say weird things about her, too, like he wants to marry her or something. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He was lying straight to everyone's face, and the worst part? They were all eating it up. Even Lisa, the one person I thought had my back, turned on me in that moment. She looked at me with pure disgust, slapped me across the face, and stormed out without even letting me explain. I was crushed. The person I cared about the most thought I was some kind of pervert. My dad came home in the of all this chaos, and I thought maybe, just maybe, he would believe me. But when Ashley told him what was going on, and Mark backed her up with his lies, my dad didn't even hesitate. He grabbed me by the arm, yanked me out of the house, and threw me onto the front lawn like I was some kind of trash. I'll never forget the look in his eyes. It wasn't just anger, it was disgust, like he didn't even know me, like I wasn't his son anymore. He called me every name in the book, accusing me of things I didn't do, saying I wasn't welcome in his house if I was going to be a danger to his family. He said I was lucky he didn't call the cops, and that was when it really hit me. I was completely on my own. I remember pleading with him, trying to explain that this was all some sick setup by Mark, but he wasn't hearing any of it. He just stood there, glaring at me like I was nothing to him, like I wasn't the kid he'd raised for 16 years. Then he shut the door in my face. I was left standing there, dazed, not knowing what to do. I mean, where was I supposed to go? I didn't have any friends I could stay with, and I knew my grandparents wouldn't help either. My dad had probably already called them to tell his version of the story, so they were out of the question. My mom's parents were dead, and I didn't have any other family close by, so I did the only thing I could think of. I sat down on the front porch, hoping, praying, that maybe they'd change their minds, that someone would come out and listen to me. But no one did. I sat there for what felt like hours, banging on the door, crying, begging them to let me back in. But the house stayed dark and silent. It was like I didn't exist anymore. Eventually, I gave up. It was getting late, and the air was starting to get cold. I had no money, no phone, nothing but the clothes on my back. I started walking, not really knowing where I was going or what I was going to do. My head was still spinning from everything that had just happened. How could my life go from bad to worse in the span of a few hours? It didn't feel real. I wandered around for a while, just trying to figure out what to do next. My mind was racing with thoughts of everything that had just happened. Lisa dumping me, Mark's lies, my dad throwing me out. It was like the walls were closing in and I couldn't breathe. But what could I do? My own family had turned their back on me, and I didn't have anyone left. I found an old park a few miles away and sat down on one of the benches. I was exhausted, physically and mentally. I couldn't think straight, and I didn't know what my next move was. I just kept replaying the whole scene in my head, over and over again. Why didn't anyone believe me? How could they just throw me out like that? I spent the night there, in that park. I don't know how I managed to fall asleep, but I must have, because the next thing I knew the sun was coming up and I was still sitting on that bench. My whole body ached and my mind was a mess. I didn't have a plan, but I knew I couldn't just sit there forever. Looking back, that night was probably one of the lowest points of my life. I was just a kid, 16 years old, and I had nowhere to go, no one to turn to. But I wasn't ready to give up. Not yet. That morning, I made a decision. I wasn't going to let what happened to me define the rest of my life. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was going to survive. After that night in the park, things didn't magically get better, but I wasn't going to let it break me. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I had to keep moving. I spent the next few days just wandering around, trying to figure out what the hell to do with myself. I didn't have any real options. No family, no friends, no place to stay. I barely had anything to my name besides the clothes on my back. But the thing was, I couldn't just give up. I didn't want to end up like those guys you see hanging around on the street forever. I knew I needed to find a way out of this. Surviving those first few weeks was rough. I had to get creative about where I slept, sometimes sneaking into places that were warm enough to crash for a few hours. Parks, old abandoned buildings, even a random bus station a couple of times. I'd learned to keep moving during the day, just to avoid looking suspicious or drawing attention. But I was hungry. Like, all the time. It was this gnawing feeling in my stomach that wouldn't go away. I tried finding odd jobs here and there, nothing official, but people would sometimes toss me a few bucks for helping with random stuff like cleaning their yard or washing windows. It wasn't much, but it kept me going. I'll never forget this one old lady who lived in a small house at the edge of the neighborhood I'd been wandering through. She must have seen me hanging around looking rough because one day she came out and asked if I needed anything. I was too proud to ask for help, so I just said I was fine. But she saw right through me and handed me a sandwich. She didn't say much, just smiled and went back inside. But man, that sandwich tasted like heaven. I hadn't eaten a decent meal in days, and I remember thinking that maybe, just maybe, not everyone in the world was terrible. A few weeks in, I managed to get some steady work at this diner not too far from where I was hanging out. The owner, Frank, was an old school kind of guy. No nonsense, but fair. He could tell I was in a rough spot, but he didn't pry. He just asked if I wanted to work in exchange for some food and a little cash under the table. It wasn't much, but it was something. I started washing dishes and cleaning up after hours. Frank didn't care that I didn't have an address or that I was basically homeless. He just needed help, and I needed the money. It was a fair trade, and it kept me off the street for a while. Working at the diner gave me some kind of purpose again. It wasn't glamorous, but it was steady. I could clean myself up in the restroom, and Frank even let me have meals from the kitchen when the shift was over. I didn't feel like a complete waste of space anymore. I started saving whatever little bit of cash I made, hoping to get enough together to rent a cheap room somewhere. It wasn't much, but it gave me a goal to work toward, and that was more than I'd had in a long time. One day while I was cleaning up after a busy lunch rush, this guy came into the diner looking like he'd been through some stuff too. He was older, probably mid-thirties, and had this kind of worn-out vibe. He wasn't homeless or anything, but you could tell life had knocked him around a bit. His name was Dave, and after he sat at the counter for a bit, we started talking while I was wiping down the tables. 
Turns out, Dave worked at a local gym. Not one of those fancy places you see on TV, but a gritty, no-nonsense boxing gym. He mentioned that they were always looking for people to help out, and he could introduce me to the owner if I was interested. I didn't know anything about boxing, but at that point, I was willing to try anything. Plus, the idea of working at a gym seemed way better than scrubbing dishes all night. A couple of days later, I showed up at the gym. It wasn't much to look at, just a bunch of old equipment, punching bags, and a ring that had seen better days. The owner, Mr. Jacobs, was this gruff, old-school kind of guy. He looked me up and down, probably thinking I was just some kid who didn't know what he was getting into. But he gave me a shot. He said if I could help clean up around the place, keep the equipment in shape, and maybe spar a bit, he'd pay me a little and teach me the basics of boxing. I wasn't sure if I'd be any good at it, but I figured, why not? At least it was something different. And honestly, the first time I stepped into the ring, I was terrible. I had no idea what I was doing, swinging wild punches like I was in a street fight. But Mr. Jacobs didn't give up on me. He was tough, but he taught me the basics. How to move, how to throw a proper punch, how to keep my guard up. It wasn't long before I started getting the hang of it. There was something about boxing that clicked with me. It was physical, sure, but it was also mental. It wasn't just about hitting harder than the other guy. It was about strategy, about controlling your emotions and staying calm under pressure. In a weird way, it helped me deal with all the anger and frustration I'd been carrying around since my family threw me out. It gave me an outlet, something to focus on that wasn't just surviving from one day to the next. Before I knew it, I was spending more time at the gym than anywhere else. I wasn't amazing or anything, but I was getting better. And as I got better, I started to feel stronger, not just physically, but mentally too. I felt like I was taking control of my life again, even if things were still far from perfect. It wasn't like boxing magically fixed everything, but it gave me something to believe in, something to keep going for. Mr. Jacobs wasn't the type to hand out compliments, but one day after a sparring session, he gave me a nod and said, you've got potential, kid. Don't waste it. That might not sound like much, but coming from him, it was huge. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life yet, but I knew I didn't want to waste whatever chances I had left. Those months at the gym were a turning point for me. I wasn't just some lost kid on the streets anymore. I had a job, a goal, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like I had a future. It wasn't much, but it was mine, and that was enough to keep me going. By the time I hit my mid-thirties, life looked nothing like I expected it would back when I was a kid. Honestly, if you had told me at 16 that I'd be standing here today, married with a family and an actual career, I would have laughed in your face. But here I was, far from where I started, and for the first time in a long while, things felt solid. Like I had a foundation under me instead of just barely hanging on, you know? I met Sarah at this little cafe near the gym where I was still working. She was different from anyone I'd met before. There wasn't any of that forced small talk or awkwardness. We just started talking, and it was easy. She wasn't prying into my past or making me feel like I had to explain every part of myself. I didn't have to be anything but me around her, and that was rare. I hadn't had that since, well, since way before all the chaos happened with my family. At first, I wasn't sure where things were going. I wasn't the type of guy who thought much about long-term relationships. I mean, my history with that sort of thing wasn't exactly great, but Sarah made me rethink all of it. She saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself for a long time. She believed in me, even when I wasn't so sure I deserved it. We started dating, and before I knew it, two years had flown by. Things between us just worked. There weren't any games or drama. She was real, and that's what I needed. She pushed me in the right ways, too. I'll never forget the day she sat me down and told me I needed to get my GED. She didn't nag me about it, didn't make me feel dumb, just laid it out plain and simple. You're smarter than you give yourself credit for, she said. You've got potential, and I'm not letting you waste it. That was a turning point for me. I guess, deep down, I knew I couldn't stay at the gym forever. It was fine when I was younger, but I needed something more stable, something I could build on. I didn't want to be the guy who barely scraped by his whole life. So I took her advice and got my GED. Was it easy? Hell no. It was like trying to remember everything I'd learned in school but hadn't thought about in years. But with Sarah's help, I made it through. Around that time, Sarah's dad came into the picture more. He was an electrician, and one day, after we'd been dating for a while, he casually mentioned that he could use some help. Now, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't exactly thrilled about the idea of working for my girlfriend's dad, but he was a good guy, and I figured it was worth a shot. Besides, I needed the work. At first, I was just doing the grunt work, carrying tools, cleaning up job sites, that kind of thing. But as time went on, I started learning the trade. It was tough, and there were days where I wanted to quit. But something kept me going. Maybe it was pride, or maybe it was knowing that I had something to prove, not just to myself, but to Sarah too. After a few years, I had picked up enough skills to get serious about the work. Sarah's dad saw I was sticking with it and offered to help me go through the process of getting licensed. I didn't really think I'd be good at it when I started, but it turned out I had a knack for it. Working with my hands, figuring out problems, it reminded me of the focus I had learned from boxing. And in a way, that focus was what kept me going every day. I wanted to be someone my wife could be proud of. Eventually, I passed my licensing exam. I was officially a licensed electrician. That might not sound like a huge deal to some people, but for me, it was everything. It wasn't just a piece of paper saying I could do the job. It was proof that I'd taken the worst parts of my life and turned them into something real. I'd gone from being homeless, sleeping in parks, to having a stable job that I was good at, with a future I could actually look forward to. Sarah and I got married shortly after I got my license. It wasn't some big fancy wedding or anything, but it was perfect for us. We kept it simple, surrounded by the people who mattered most. Her family had been amazing to me, and they were all there. My side of the family? Well, I didn't exactly have anyone left to invite, but that didn't bother me anymore. My in-laws became my family, and I realized that family doesn't have to be the people you're born with. Sometimes, it's the people who choose to stand by you, even when things are rough. It's funny how things work out. Looking back, it's like everything that happened led me here. I went through all that pain and hardship, and somehow, it brought me to a place I never thought I'd reach. 
Sarah and I have four amazing daughters now. They're my world, and they're growing up in a home filled with love and support, everything I didn't have when I was their age. I'm not saying everything's perfect, because it's not. No family is perfect, but we're good, and that's what matters. Sometimes I think about the old days, where I was, who I was back then, and I can't help but be grateful that I didn't give up. I could have easily ended up in a very different place if I hadn't met Sarah, or if I hadn't taken that job with her dad, or if I just let the anger from my past consume me. But here I am, pushing 50, with a wife I adore, kids who drive me crazy but who I love more than anything, and a career I never thought I'd have. It's weird to say, but I'm proud of myself. It took me a long time to get here, and there were a lot of moments where I didn't think I'd make it. But now, standing on the other side of it all, I realize that the life I built is so much more than I could have ever imagined, and at the end of the day, that's all I really need. So here's the thing I wasn't expecting. After all these years of having nothing to do with my old life, I suddenly got an email from Emily, my stepsister. Yeah, that Emily, the one who probably barely remembered me since she was just a kid when everything went down. At first, I wasn't sure how to feel about it. I mean, I hadn't heard from anyone in my dad's family in over 30 years, and suddenly, out of nowhere, she's reaching out. I remember staring at my inbox for a good 10 minutes, not sure if I should even open it. Part of me wanted to just delete it and pretend like it never happened. I've got a good life now, right? Why stir up the past? But curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked it. The email was long. Like, really long. It started out kind of awkward, with Emily explaining how she found my contact info and why she was writing. Turns out she had no clue about the truth behind what happened when I was kicked out. She had been told the same story as everyone else, that I was this creep who stole her underwear and tried to do God knows what. She went on to say that she believed it all because, well, why wouldn't she? She was a kid, and Mark was her brother. Why would he lie about something like that? And then came the real reason she was emailing me. Apparently Mark, my stepbrother, the same one who set me up and ruined my life, had gotten pretty drunk at a family gathering recently. In front of a bunch of people, he started bragging about how he'd framed me. He thought it was hilarious, telling everyone how he planted Emily's underwear in my drawer and made up the story about me creeping on her. He even admitted to doing it because he was jealous that I had started dating Lisa, the girl he had a crush on. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I mean, I knew Mark had set me up, but to hear it confirmed all these years later? It was like a punch to the gut. Emily said she was shocked, and so was Lisa, who apparently was at the gathering too. Yeah, that Lisa, the girl who dumped me without a second thought after the whole thing went down. She heard the confession firsthand, and according to Emily, she freaked out. Emily said she had spent the entire weekend trying to track me down because she felt terrible about what had happened. She wanted to apologize, face to face if possible, and she even offered to fly out to wherever I was. She kept saying how sorry she was that she had believed Mark and how she wished she had known the truth back then. Now here's where it gets tricky. On the one hand, I could tell from her email that Emily was genuinely sorry. She was young when it all happened, and I can't blame her for believing what she was told. But on the other hand, it was like all those old wounds I thought had healed were suddenly ripped open again. For 30 years, I've been living with the knowledge that my family turned their back on me, threw me out like trash, and never bothered to find out the truth. And now, after all this time, they suddenly want to make amends? I didn't know what to feel. I've spent years moving on from that part of my life. I built a new family, one that loves me for who I am. Sarah, my wife, and our daughters are my world, and I never thought I'd need anything else. But still, that email stirred something up inside me that I hadn't felt in years. I showed the email to Sarah, half expecting her to tell me to ignore it, but she's not like that. She sat down next to me, read the whole thing, and then just looked at me and said, what do you want to do? That's the thing about Sarah. She always lets me decide for myself. She didn't push me one way or the other. Part of me wanted to reply with something snarky like, oh, now you believe me? Took you long enough. But I didn't. It's not that I'm still angry, exactly. It's more like I'm just, indifferent. The life I have now is good. Great, even. I've got everything I need. Do I really want to open that door again after all this time? Emily said in the email that she wanted to make up for lost time, to try and rebuild some kind of relationship. She didn't mention my dad or Mark, though, and honestly, I didn't care about hearing from them. They're the ones who made the choice to believe a lie and throw me away. As far as I'm concerned, they can stay in the past where they belong. But Emily? I don't know. She was just a kid back then, caught up in the middle of a mess she didn't create, and it sounded like she was genuinely trying to make things right. That's what makes this so hard. If she had been reaching out with some half-assed apology, I'd have no problem telling her to get lost. But she seems like she really means it, and now I'm stuck wondering if I should let her back into my life, even just a little. I haven't replied yet. Every time I sit down to type something, I freeze. It's like all the words I want to say just get stuck. Do I want to forgive them? Do I want to let go of everything that happened and pretend like we can just move on? I don't know. And then there's Lisa. Emily mentioned that Lisa wanted to reach out to me too, but she didn't know how I'd feel about it. Honestly, I don't even know what to say to her. After everything that happened, she just walked away and never looked back. She never gave me a chance to explain myself, never questioned whether Mark might have been lying. She was part of the reason I ended up on the streets. I've spent years building a life without any of them, and I don't need their validation or their apologies to feel whole. But at the same time, there's this part of me, this small, quiet part, that wonders if maybe, just maybe, letting them say their piece could give me some closure I didn't know I needed. For now, though, I'm just sitting with it. I don't know what I'll do yet, but whatever I decide, I'm doing it on my terms. I've come too far to let anyone from my past mess with the life I've built. Maybe I'll reply. Maybe I won't. Either way, I'm good where I am. Update, I finally decided to reply to Emily. Took me a while to get there, but I did. I kept it short, didn't see the point in writing some long message. I told her that I appreciated her reaching out and that I was glad she knew the truth now. I didn't dive into all the stuff about how her brother basically ruined my life, and I didn't unload years of resentment or anything like that. Just said my piece and left it at that. Honestly, it felt weird to even send the email. For years, I never thought I'd hear from anyone in that part of my life again. 
And now I'm sitting here typing a reply to a person I'd written off ages ago. I thought it would be harder than it was, but once I hit send, it was like a weight lifted off my chest. Not a big one, but something, you know? Like I could finally close that chapter, or at least part of it. Emily replied pretty quickly. She said she understood if I didn't want to reconnect or do any of the whole makeup for lost time thing, but she wanted to apologize again in person if I was open to it. That was the tricky part for me. I wasn't sure if I wanted to open that door. An apology in an email is one thing, but face to face? That's a whole other level of dealing with the past, and I wasn't sure if I was ready for it. I talked it over with Sarah. Like I said before, she's good at listening without pushing me in one direction or the other. She told me that if I felt like I needed to hear Emily out in person, I should go for it. But she also reminded me that I didn't know anyone anything, and if I wanted to just leave it where it was, that would be fine, too. No pressure. After thinking about it for a couple days, I told Emily we could meet. Just her, though. I didn't want Mark or anyone else showing up. I figured it would be good to hear her out, let her say what she needed to say, and then I could decide if I wanted to keep any sort of connection with her going forward. We met at a small cafe not far from where I live. It was one of those places where no one really bothers you, which was perfect. I got there a little early and waited, not sure what to expect. When she walked in, I barely recognized her at first. I mean, it had been over 30 years. She looked different, obviously, but there was still something familiar in her face. She sat down, and for a minute, neither of us really knew what to say. It was awkward, but I guess that's to be expected. She broke the silence first, apologizing again for everything that had happened. She was tearing up, and I could tell this wasn't easy for her, either. She kept saying how sorry she was that she believed the lies, how she had no idea what really happened until recently. I just listened. I didn't really have much to say at that point. After she got through the apology, we talked a bit about what had happened since then. Turns out, Mark and Lisa had split up years ago, and she hadn't spoken to him much since. She didn't give too many details, and I didn't ask. I wasn't there for a trip down memory lane, I just wanted to get this whole thing over with. By the end of it, I told her I appreciated her coming to talk, but I wasn't sure if I was ready to just let everything go. She understood, said she didn't expect me to. We parted on good terms, and I think that was enough for now. It's not like things are magically better, but it feels like I've got some closure. That's more than I thought I'd get. 